Hello, everyone. Um, please confirm if you can hear me on the chat box. Can you all hear me loud and clear? Okay, thank you, Victor. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, you're all very much um, welcome to, to today's um, data science webinar. My name is Sasha Acheng. I'm part of the marketing team here at Moringa, and I will be your host today. Um, all right, so without much further ado, I think I'll just go straight to like um, introducing who on my team is present here. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, my name is Sasha Achen. Um, I'm a program marketing manager and data science is pretty much um, my baby, if I may so call it. I'm very passionate about it and it's been um, an honor seeing how many people have joined our programs and graduated and going to do amazing things in the market. So Biko um, is our events lead, but he's currently um, away. He's out of town, just to go and talk to other people on the other side of Nairobi and sensitize them about um, our programs and what we do. So he sends his greetings and apologies for not being here. So allow me to welcome Lucille so that she can just introduce herself, but you get to hear more from her um, later on. Welcome, Lucille. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucille, like Sasha said, Lucille Kaleha. I'm also very, very passionate about data science. And actually, I started my journey in Moringa, so I'm very happy to be here to be introducing other people to what we do at Moringa in terms of data science. Can't wait to talk to you guys about everything ML. Thank you, Sasha. Nice. All right. So I'd like to know where everybody is coming from. Um, but I, I, I foresee that people are actually in transit, maybe from work, from school. So for those of us who have made it on time, um, I'd like to hear from you and know where you're joining us from and what your expectations are uh, for today's webinar. When you saw the topic machine learning with Python, um, you know, what sparked your interest to sign up and, you know, join this uh, webinar. So. If there's anyone who's um, who's interested uh, in sharing, please feel free to just share the the hand reaction. I'll be able to see it unmute you, and you can say hi to everyone. If you're shy, you can type in the chat box. Just tell me where you're joining us from. If you're from Kenya, where in Kenya, and what are you expecting to learn today? Yeah. So let's. Uh, make this session very interactive and engaging um, so that we can be able to see, you know, where are people coming from and what are the expectations from this workshop today? Any volunteers? Okay. Yes, Martin, go ahead. Uh, hello. I am Martin and uh, I am from Mary. I am a student at Kenya University and uh, I am chairing to machine learning. So when I take it, I just prepare it so tight and I wanted to know like the possibly daily applications of machine learning to our society. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for joining and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this workshop, yeah, we will meet your expectations. Yeah. Um, he's joining us all day from Nyeri. Can we hear where everybody else is joining from? Feel free to chat us, um, or rather to type on the chat box. You can just type on the chat box. OK. 
Okay. Um, let me just fix my thing here. Can you all hear me? Uh, Lucille, please confirm if you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. All right. So I'm seeing uh, Victor is joining us from Rungai. Um, are you even in Kenya? <laughs> How's the diaspora? Uh, Kevin, you're welcome. Joining us from Nairobi. Geoffrey, Joanne, everybody here is from Nairobi. That's great. Um, any other volunteer <laughs> who'd like to share what the expectations are? Um, at the end of this workshop, what would you like to learn? What would you like to, what would you like to be your takeaway um, at the end of this um, workshop? Okay, so I've seen Francis has shared that he's from Nairobi, welcome. Uh, he's passionate about data science. I expect to learn the implementation of different machine learning models. And I hope Moringa will provide a certificate of participation. Ah, okay. <laughs> so you'll definitely learn the different applications and implementations of um, different machine learning models. Uh, but um, on the side of a certificate of participation, you have to forgive us. For today, we won't be providing that because this is a free webinar. Uh, but join Moringa School, you know, join one of our programs and uh, you'll get a whole certificate plus skills, right? <laughs> okay, let's hear from Anjala. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. So, um, Anjala Rubin, I think we met on, over the weekend, we had a, a meetup event at uh, Nairobi Garage. So for me, I'm also, um, I'm an alumni of Moringa School. I did software engineering, but uh, for now, after Moringa, I went ahead to do data science and machine learning. So for now, for this particular event, I'm looking forward to maybe learn something new or improve on my skills, what I've not learned maybe before or what I've not done before so that is thank you okay awesome thank you so much angela for joining us and once again everybody you're welcome so before we get to um the rest of our agenda today we have like two hours left so i'd like us to just spend like a few minutes on a fun icebreak activity i know people have been you know, like you spent your entire day maybe working, studying. So this is just something fun. Um, and I hope it won't fail me. So let's see. Okay. All right. Um, just give me a minute. Okay. So on this icebreaker activity, um, I don't know how many people here are in the dev space. So some of these questions might be familiar with you. I'm really hoping you guys will also guess the answers correctly. Um, Cause even in data science, um, part of what you're gonna learn are some, you know, software engineering fundamentals and principles. Cause there is a bit of coding like with Python and all that um, that you will learn if, I, if and when you choose to join the program. So this is just um, a fun icebreaker to familiarize yourself with some software engineering funds. Yeah. Okay, so I can see some people are already guessing. <laughs> what two words every programmer learned to code fast in? Yeah, all of you are right. All of you are correct. Anyone else wants to give it a try? Maybe you, your first, um, programming projects was in something else like Java coffee or something. Okay. Do we agree that everybody started with hello world? Kevin, you think two plus five, why though? 
Kevin Kavura, you wanna unmute yourself and maybe like share with us how you learned two plus five. Oh, through our programming, interesting. Okay. All right, so the correct answer is hello world. That was pretty easy. Um, okay, so next question. What is the golden rule in programming? Anyone wants to give a guess? What is the golden rule in programming? Just guess, there's no wrong or right answer. I wanna see what you guys think. What is the golden rule in the world of programming? If it works, don't touch it. <laughs> oh, Francis, yes. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one because anything could go wrong, right? Anyone else who wants to give it a try? <laughs> What is the golden rule in programming? <laughs> Which rules do you guys follow? If at all you're learning how to code. I wanna see more guesses, guys. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yes, Catherine, that's a good principle. Keep it simple always, yep. Don't repeat yourself. Simple as possible, but not simpler. I like this. Lucille, do you think on um, these rules in programming? Absolutely, absolutely second that. Okay, so let's see the answer. If it works, don't touch it. <laughs> so Francis was, uh, was correct, but I feel like even the other ones, um, do apply. Those are really good golden rules and principles to stand by. Okay, I think this is our second last question. So why do programmers keep pressing the F5 button? To, Francis says to run the code, okay. This is actually a pun. It's actually those dad jokes. Hint, 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 hint like a dad joke. So why do programmers keep pressing the F5 button? You, why do you keep pressing the F5 button? Any more guesses? Any more guesses, any more guesses? Let's see how people think. <laughs> Mumeshindwa, I reveal the answer. You can give a show of hand if you want me to reveal the answer. <laughs> it is refreshing. Kevin, I feel like I feel like you're Googling these answers because why are you so correct? Yeah, because it's refreshing. I know that's a bad joke. Um all right, so last question, last question. Um, and I hope there'll be different winners other than. Francis and Kelvin, what is the biggest lie in computer programming? What do you think is the biggest lie in computer programming? Think about it. <laughs> The biggest lie in computer programming. Mwenye tapata ina kutumia airtime. Sorry for non-English speakers. Um, for those who are in Kenya, I'll send you airtime um, if you get this question right. You instantly become a hacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lie. You need some experience. Catherine says it's hard. Mm. So you all think computer programming is pretty easy. Okay, are those the final participants? Final answers? It only takes a few days to build something 
Priscilla says HTML is a programming language. Last, last, last guess. AI can replace programs. All right, let's see the answer. HTML is a programming language. Priscilla, you're right. So what is HTML then? What is HTML? <laughs> Since it's not a programming language, what is it? Let's let's sensitize people about what HTML is all about. Priscilla, you wanna you wanna unmute yourself and like share. Okay, Priscilla, you can unmute yourself and share your response. Hi everyone. So uh, thanks so much for the webinar. I think it's a markup language, uh, which is uh, standard and used for creating web pages. Yes, spot on, spot on, spot on. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Uh, please uh, private message me here on the chat box. Just go to the chat box, then send chat to Moringa School Events. Send me your number, and then I'll send you some airtime. <laughs> all right so guys we've come to the end of our icebreaker activity thank you so much for all everybody who's been participating for those who are joining us uh worry not we are just about to get started um and thank you so much for making time away from your busy schedules to join our webinar today so what can you expect um we're gonna start briefly with an intro to moringa school because we understand we have some new people here they don't know about Moringa and the programs that we offer. So very briefly, I'll take you through an overview of uh, Moringa School. Then right after that, I'll welcome Lucille Kaleha, who is our, who is a data scientist and a technical mentor and does so many amazing things in the tech space. She'll be a facilitator for today's workshop. So she'll take you through. I hope you guys are ready with your laptops, with your notebook, because um, we'll be having a practical session. You will literally do this hands-on while Lucille is uh, facilitating here today. So I hope your laptops, you have the softwares and installations that we have shared with you via email um, ready and a notebook just in case you don't have a laptop with you so that um, you can follow up later and practice and learn with us. Um, then afterwards, um, I know we have questions around our data science program, so I'll be back here joined um, with a couple of um, my team members from our admissions team. Um, I'm seeing a couple of them here, so we'll be tag teaming to just respond to a couple of your questions around our program. So I'm seeing Lisa, please don't leave the call. <laughs> Who else am I seeing? Um, you'll get to meet them a little bit later. Yeah, so Lisa and even our TMs um, will be able to assist me in responding to some of the questions you have around our data science program. Is that okay? Can I get a thumbs up if we're all together and then proceed? Awesome, thank you, Sydney. More thumbs up, more thumbs up, more thumbs up so that I know if we're all together. Thank you, Angela. All right, great. All right, so um, how many people, this is your first time ever interacting with uh, Moringa School, attending an event for the first time by show of hand? This is your first time you don't know anything about what we do or have ever attended an event by Moringa. Or rather a workshop, a class, a master class. By show of hand, can I see how many people? Okay. Thank you, Mildred. Um, Angela, David, Victor. Oh, okay. That's a good number. Okay, fair enough. So Moringa School is a, a tech bootcamp that was started a, 
that was started way back um, in 2014 by a lady known as Audrey Chen, who had come to Kenya and she was working um, in the journalism sector. Interesting. And, you know, like after doing some research work and just attending a conference around like tech and the education space here in Kenya, they found out that, um, you know, there was lack of like global, um, co globally competitive tech skills. Um, and also in the market, the jobs were many, but they had to contract foreigners to fill in those jobs. So knowing that we have so many graduates, even from like our universities and um, local colleges here, the question was how comes these people are not getting hired in these jobs that are in demand? So that's how Moringa came up. Um, and our role in the African education space, African tech space is to skill, train, and develop world-class developers, right? And we started off with a software engineering program for a couple of years. Then later on, like two years back, we introduced a data science program and many other new courses like cybersecurity, product design and all that. We have quite a number on our product portfolio right now, um, or rather in our course offering right now, we've been able to train so many young Africans we skill so many um, experienced um, tech professionals and developers in different spaces, not only in Kenya, but even in other countries across Africa. We even have quite a number of African students from different continents signing up to our programs because it's available online and they come in, we train them and they're able to do amazing things like building tech related solutions um, you know, just to solve problems, not only here in Africa, but across the world. So um, I think on the previous slide, you've seen that our mission is to build this talent and opportunities through transformative tech-based learning experiences. And you'll see shortly how we do that. How is Moringa different from like other um, traditional or like conventional um, institutions? Our learning model is very, very, very um, different. Um, and for those who have passed through our hands, like we have a couple of alumni who have just spoken and said that they're, you know, they're just here to upskill and learn more, even after completing a software engineering course, they can tell you that Moringa School gives you a wholesome experience, right? You can see through these different arms that make up our learning model, um, people come out of Moringa having not only the technical skills, but also the professional skills that are required in the workplace. Um, we also really focus a lot on project-based learning. So even when you join our data science course, you will engage with real life um, data sets, real life business focused problems. Um, we'll expose you to like industry related um, um, projects, um, even like for internship opportunities, you'd see that we have a lot of these relationships already in the industry. So by the time you're leaving Moringa, let's say after you've taken a data science full-time course, which is 25 weeks, um, you come out ready to um, you know, get your first junior data scientist role, a junior data analyst role. And we work with you even after graduation for like 12 years. Um, we have a career development team that supports you um, in like just preparing for jobs, preparing for interviews, um, forwarding you like open opportunities that you need to work on. When we get projects, you're also involved in working on those um, company, various organizations um, projects. So Moringa School, you can see that it's very different from the um, conventional um, education system. All right, so um, why Moringa School? I think I've already talked about the unique um, learning model. So other than that, other than the career readiness aspect and project-based learning, our programs are very market aligned. So we won't train you in things that are obsolete. We really keep up with what's happening in the market, what jobs, um, what like um, hiring managers are looking for. We try to incorporate that in our curriculum and our content. 
You also get access to a very active alumni community once you graduate. You also get technical mentor support. So you're not necessarily learning on your own or by yourself in a corner, even if you're online. Um, you get access to a technical mentor who works with you, is able to help you solve problems, um, take you through the content, what you're learning, how to improve your projects, how to improve your, uh, on your assessments and all that. Um, also, the advantage of Moringa School is that our programs are accelerated. So you don't have to spend an entire one year or four years learning something. You come in, you dedicate, let's say like six months, um, you just focus maybe on a full-time course or a part-time program. And by the end of it, you see that you are up to par to even compete uh, for jobs in the job market space. Um, yeah, so this just ways that I've told you, after you graduate for 12 months, we still work with you uh, for uh, just to prepare you. We call this the graduate support, um, the graduate support and like career readiness phase, <laughs> if I can just give it uh, that simple term. So these are some of the ways um, we'll be engaging you and just supporting you until you land your first employment opportunity. And our graduates have, are currently working in these companies. These are just but a few, uh, but so, so many companies, not only here locally, but across um, the world. So our main partners who we'd like to really thank uh, Master, the MasterCard um, Foundation, through which um, they've been able to provide quite a number of scholarships for people who are not able to afford our programs fully. Um, so you'd be seeing some of like um, on social media, if you've been engaging with us, um, where we do a call for applications, like apply for partial scholarship, financial aid, and all that. That is proudly, proudly, proudly sponsored by MasterCard, the MasterCard Foundation, and we are very grateful for the support that they've been able to give young people to learn and develop themselves. Um, we also have another main uh, partner that is Flat Iron School. So we work with um, Flat Iron School, which is a tech bootcamp based in the United States to offer you guys a globally competitive curriculum. So you've seen that I've mentioned our course and our learning model is very different. It's because we've incorporated um, it to like world-class standards. So the same thing that people are learning in the United States, wherever they are in the world, if at all they, they sign up to Flatiron School, we are offering it here at a very, very cheap, uh, and subsidized cost um, through Moringa School. Yeah, so be rest assured that if at all you make a decision to join one of our programs, um, you're making the right decision and you won't regret it. Okay, so that's enough um, about uh, Moringa School. We will be back later on um, after the workshop to address any questions that you may have regarding our institution, the programs that we offer um, at the end of this workshop. If at all you have a burning question, maybe you might drop off, feel free to drop it on the chat box. Um, myself and my team will be ready to respond. Um, so we'd like this workshop to be very, very interactive. So ask as many questions as possible. You can drop them in the chat box. You can use the hand. Um, emoji so that we're able to see you on the back end. We can unmute you and just let um, the facilitator hear your question and help you wherever you are stuck. So don't feel stuck, ask as many questions as possible. We want you all to come out of this workshop having learned about data science, about machine learning with Python and even completed an interesting project. So let me just get a thumbs up to see if we are all on the same page before I invite Lucille to take it over from here. Okay, thank you, Victor. Are we all on the same page before I hand it over to the facilitator? Great. 
All right, thank you so much. So help me welcome um, Lucio um, to take us through the workshop today. Thank you so much, Sasha. It was a very good introduction to our programs. Hi, everyone. For those who are joining in late, my name is Lucille Kaleha. Um, so before we get started, I've just shared a Google folder on the chat. Could you kindly open it, download the data file, and then for the IPYNB file, I'd like you to open the link on Google Colab and then make a copy so that we can just go through it together while we get a bit of practical practice with it. <laughs> um, if you do not, if you have Jupyter Notebook installed on your local machine, you can download it and then open it with Anaconda. I will give you two minutes to do that and then we can kick off. Hello again. Welcome to our workshop. So we're going to be doing machine learning with Python. Anyone who's been able to download the data, open the link on Google Colab, let me know in the chat or with your hands up whether we can see the same thing on our ends. Just giving it two more minutes so that we're all able to be on the same page. Um, so as Sasha said, we'd like the session to be as, as interactive as possible. So feel free to unmute when we ask a question, um, put it on the chat. Let's have some fun here. I think we'll start with the basic. Um, all right, so you see my introduction on the screen. My name is Lucille Kaleha. I have a background in actuarial science from JQuot. And then I fully transitioned into data science in 2019, and I practice as a data analyst, ML engineer. I also do a bit of process automation with RPA. Um, right. Can everyone see my screen? Actually, maybe just one person and meet and let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, beautiful. So can anyone tell me, apart from what I have on the screen right now, this is a very, very generic uh, definition of what machine learning is. In, a, in general terms, it's the science of getting machines to interpret, process, and analyze data in order to solve real world problems. Can anyone else tell me a definition that resonates with them? Feel free. Um, I think I'll need Sasha to maybe take me through the answers on the chat. If you're able to see what people are saying.
Can anyone tell me what they think machine learning is? You can use layman layman's terms if you like. If you've interacted with it, also give us a definition that you feel speaks to you. So, well, it looks like Sasha's not here. So I'll just I'll take it away. Uh, so no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, right. Yeah. What yeah. Is I'll do. Are we getting any answers on what is machine learning on the charts? No, we don't have any answers, but guys, you can unmute but, yourselves and yes. participate. Yeah. I think I'll go. Go ahead, Gonzalo. Yeah, so this is uh, for machine learning, just in simple terms, just use of data. Computer use data to data and algorithms to imitate how human being learn or improve yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good answer but i feel like you have generalized to the wide uh, ai now we know that ml and ai are the hottest topics right now but ai is what we say tries to mimic the human brain so that it learns from unseen pattern and then learns to predict what those patterns are or what they mean uh, ml is a bit simpler than that uh, you'll hear people say ML is a little less complex, it's a little less uh, computationally expensive. So that is what we're going to be looking at today. Machine learning, specifically with Python. So there are different branches of machine learning. We have supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Can anyone in the chat describe, just pick one branch and then give us an example or give us a definition, a definition of what you think it is? interactive sessions possible. Oh, well, people are getting a bit more comfortable with us. We can just go. Okay, um, I'll take one. <laughs> sure. And so for, I'll take for supervised learning. For supervised learning is where you're training your models, targeting a certain variable. You have a target, a target, a target variable that is. Yes, absolutely. So for supervised learning, we have what we call independent variables and the target variables. You'll hear people say, call the target variable the class, and you'll hear people say the independent variables as the labels. Um, the difference between now supervised learning and unsupervised learning is we don't have a target variable in unsupervised learning. You have to learn from your data and know what it's predicting at the end. So for supervised learning, we mostly have the target variable that we're trying to predict for. So we have an example here. Um, if you want to make a classification model or to say, sorry about my background noise. Uh, so you want to create a classification model to distinguish what data points lead to a cat and what data points are describe a dog. So in order to train this model, you're going to have several images of cats and dogs, and then you're going to label them. So you have certain characteristics of um, probably, let me say the size is the one characteristic that is jumping out that is different. So size could be the biggest um, indicator of this being a cat. So when you go to our supervised learning model, you realize we talk about feature importance. Feature importance, we're just talking about the main variables that are going to have a very big weight in predicting your outcome or your target variable. So in this case, you have your data points labels for cats and for dogs. So then our machine learning looks at the different characteristics of this particular target and then at the end, after you've given it, you, you fed your machine model into this, it can predict whether it's a cat or a dog. I'm going to pause there in case we have any questions about supervised learning. Remember, I'm not looking at the chat, so feel free to unmute and tell me what you think about supervised learning. All right, beautiful. So a depiction of supervised learning right here, we have the labeled data. So the, what we're looking at labeled data here is mostly the 
data points that I'm talking about, the independent variables. And then the labels, this is the column where it shows you what this um, variable is labeled as, what is it called, or what are these features, or rather these features that are in this date independent variables normally turn to uh, say rectangle, circle, triangle, or hexagon. So you pass your label data with the labels into a machine learning model, and then you're going to, in this section, you split the data into training set, the independent variables, test set, where you're going to pass your model through the unseen data, which we're calling the test set, and then it will make the predictions. Now for unsupervised learning, the difference is, I'm just going to go directly into our image. We, we have the independent variables, but we do not have any for information about what these independent variables are. So in unsupervised learning, we have algorithms such as k-nearest neighbors that groups the data depending on their characteristics and then pass, through them, pass them through that model and then separate them accordingly. We're not saying that when you have unlabeled data and you pass them through a machine learning model, then the results will be labeled. It will be just a group that distinctifies your data according to their characteristics. A good example that I like to give here is when you have a bag of fruits. So you have bananas, you have oranges, you have apples. So what our ML model can do is this, in this case is separate them. So it will give you a basket of apples, a basket of bananas, a basket of oranges, but it's not going to tell you what these things are. It's just separated them according to their characteristics. And that is the main difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Okay. Great. Um, so today, what we'll mostly be focusing on is supervised learning. We're going to build a classification model. We're going to follow through with the project that we have today, build a classification model that evaluates the condition of a car based on these characteristics. The characteristics we're talking about is the independent variables and then the condition of the car is our target variable. So we're going to look at the different characteristics of a car and then try to tell, try to see whether the characteristics point to uh, an unacceptable car, a car that is an acceptable condition, a car that is in good condition or a car that is in very good condition. Now the four things that you've had me mention, those are the classes in our target variable. I'm just going to pause here for questions, comments, or in case anyone needs clarification. Can you see there's a question? Hmm? Clarify in simple terms, <laughs> supervised versus unsupervised learning. So I think many people who join today are complete beginners. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you just simplify the definition and give practical examples. Sure, sure. Let me just go back to supervised learning. In simple terms, um, let me see, someone was saying earlier today that people in tech don't know how to say things in layman's terms, so I will try not to be a member of that group. Um, in simple terms, you have, I'm going to repeat the example on cats and dogs. So I have a data set that has information on cats and dogs. For supervised learning, this data set is going to have a list of columns that has characteristics of a cat and a dog as data points. So the first data point is going to be, and again, for, not again, I haven't said this before. So for most data sets, you're going to have what is called an index column that annotates what variable we're talking about. So for index one, we have orange, uh, whether it pars or not could be a categorical variable where you have zero if it pars and one if it does not. Um, we have four legs, uh, we have fluffy tail, that can also be categorical, whether, whether the tail is fluffy or not fluffy. Um, 
We can have spiky tongue. I think cats have a spiky tongue. That's also going to be a categorical variable where it's either yes, it has a spiky tongue or no, it does not. Um, you guys can help me with other characteristics of cats and dogs. So those I've mentioned are for cats. I'm a cat person, so I know those ones pretty well. For a dog, we can say <laughs> characteristics of a dog. So it has, sorry, this um, it has four legs as well. We can say the color is maybe black or mixed with white. Uh, we can talk about the furry hair, whether it has hair or not. Um, I'm just going to stop there. Those are all the examples I can think of. So we can have a data set with different data points with all this information. So the first draw could be information about a certain cut, and then there's going to be a target variable that labels it cut. The second column is going to be different att attributes of a different animal, which is also going to be labeled dog or cat. Now, for a supervised machine learning, what we do is after we have cleaned our data set, did a bit of data engineering, don't be scared of the terms I'm mentioning now. We're going to cover them as we move. Um, so what machine learning does, we're going to clean our data, feature engineer, do all the good stuff, and then separate it into two sets. We're going to have X, I'm sorry, a train test and a test set. So the train set is what we're going to use to feed our machine learning model in there and then kind of train it to know that whenever it sees variables connected like this, then it's most probably a cat or whenever it sees the variables connected like this then it's a dog so then after we've taught our machine learning model to learn from these characteristics we are going to pass now the test set through this model and see how well it's able to generalize so if it sees this data points this different characteristics or variables then is this going to be a cat or is this going to be a dog okay uh, give me a round of thumbs up plus ones whatever you can to be sure we're good about supervised learning. I'm going to say silence is golden. So I'll move to supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Here, right, so I have a beautiful analogy there of red and blue balls, but I'm going to talk about the fruits again. For unsupervised learning, you have a bunch of unlabeled data, and I'm going to call this a basket full of fruits. So you have your oranges, apples, mangoes, bananas. It, it's whole one whole data set with just information that you're not sure where it's pointing towards. You're not sure what this information is saying. In this, uh, in this situation now, what the machine learning model would do or the particular machine learning model that you choose will do is it will group the data according to the characteristics. Um, so for fruits, we'd say apples are red. We have red apples, green apples. We have bananas, we have mangoes, we have melons. So the model is going to look at the different characteristics of these features and then group them together. In this case, the result is not going to be, okay, so these are rectangles, these are circles, these are triangles, and this is a hexagon. No, it's just going to give you different groups of the variables, but has grouped them according to their characteristics. And that's about it, about the difference. And that's as simple as you can make it for difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. But I welcome any opinions for anyone who has a different description of how if you feel like yours is more layman than mine, anyone can unmute and just tell us what they think. We good? All right. Um, so has everyone been able to create a copy of the notebook that I'm looking at right now? Okay, so uh, Sydney says that he has managed to create a copy. Oh. And then I think David was responding to your to your request. Mm -hmm. He's asking if this is right. I think he's checking if he's understood supervised and unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. So supervised learning is based on described features separating cats and dogs. And mm -hmm. supervised learning seems to be the machine 
intuiting features about the data given? Yes, uh, let me just reiterate what he's asking. So supervised learning is based on data that is labeled. So we have the features and we also have the target variable that tells us what these features are. So we have the features and then it, at the end it says this feature points to a cut. For unsupervised learning instead, it's just going to have all the features of these cats and dogs, but no labeled data to let us know that these features normally point to a cat. All right, I hope everyone else is on the same page that we are. I just want yeah. to dive, dive in directly now to our project. So if you've been able to open on Google Colab, make sure to create a copy create a copy and then you can start working on it. So after you've created a copy, come to, I hope you're seeing my screen, come to on your left, come to files. And then, so give it a second, it's going to connect your runtime. Right, after you see the green mark here for connected, click on the upload file icon. So upload to session storage and then go directly to your file and upload the car.data file that you just downloaded. So while we do that, I'm just going to talk about the data a bit. So I put the link for the data set there. You can go through the link and see a bit of the description that they've given us. But the data set was gotten from UCI. It's an open data set. So it describes seven attributes of a car. Like I said earlier, we're going to look at a car, its characteristics and then see whether our model is able to generalize very well in pointing at what characteristics point to an, an, a car in an acceptable condition or a car in a very good condition. Right, so for people who are using Google Colab, you're definitely going to need to pip install Pandas profiling. So just uncomment that line. What you're going to do is you can either just delete the hash or put the cursor to where that commented line is and then press control forward slash. So don't comment the uncomment only. If you need comment the this command, the pip install pandas profiling. After you do that, just run it. There's a play button here that you can use. Just run the cell. So it's going to install the pandas for profiling that we're going to use for a bit of data understanding. Right, so the out, this is what the outcome is going to be. It's going to be so much information there, but as long as you're seeing the last line, let me just scroll down. Well, that's a lot. So as long as you see the last line successfully installed, you're good. So from the beginning of the call, uh, some of the people that we've gotten have already introduced with programming. So I hope most people are familiar with Python. And if you are, then you know, before you do any sort of data analysis, there are certain libraries that you're going to load into your environment. And that is what our first cell is doing right here. So we're loading a few libraries that we are going to need throughout the data. So we have the data we need for manipulating and loading our data sets, pandas, numpy, and the pandas profiling that's going to help us do a bit of data understanding. And then we have libraries for visualizing our data, what we're going to use to model, and then what we're going to use to evaluate a model and finally save it for deployment. All 
Right. So I hope we've all run that cell. That cell is not going to have any output. So just run it. Okay. So deprecation warning, that's not something we need to worry about now. All right, after that, we can load our data set. Now, this is the big difference that you're probably going to see with the different types of files that you're working with. We're currently working with a file called car.data, and this is common for files that are found in the, uh, what is it called, the website that we just talked about, the ICS.UCI website. Most of their data sets are .data. Now, the good thing about Pandas is it knows how to generalize the .data files, so we can use pd.read csv and then load the .data file. For most other languages, you'd have to convert it into either Excel, CSV, before you can load it into your environment. But um, let's try this. Let's uncomment this line and then run that command and see what happens. So a characteristics of the .data files is when you run them directly with pd.read CSV, it does not give you the different um, column names. So that's why we have to instantiate the column names as well. So from the data dictionary, so up there, we know what the columns are. The first one is buying for buying price. The second one is maintenance for uh, the cost of maintenance, the number of doors in the car, the number of persons that fit in the car. Lug boot is the size of the lug. Of, where we can well put our luggage, the boots basically, and then safety and class, which is what we're going to be predicting for. This is our target variable. So you can just go back and uncomment that line, control forward slash, and run it again. So what the df.head command does, it, it gives you the fast five, uh, data points that you have in our data frame. Let's we can add a cell here and do df dot tail. And don't forget for every function that you run in Python, you're not supposed to forget to add the brackets at the end so that it gives you a result. Let's see what happens if you do not add that. So it gives you a result, but it's very unstructured and unreadable. You can't be able to tell where what goes. So for good practice, you do that. You can also specify how many data points you want to see. So we can say df.tail, say 10. It will give us the last 10 entries in our data frame. All right, great. So now we can move to data understanding. And before we do that, I'm just going to pause there for questions, comments, if anyone has any, if your notebook is having a certain issue, let me know. Um, Victoria, so I shared, there's a link that was shared on the chat where you can download the data set, just download it. And then are you using Google Colab or are you using Jupyter Notebook on your local machine? Collab, right. So after you download it, come to files, and then there's this icon for upload to session storage. You can upload it here. So, um, yes, go ahead. Go back to, to where you displayed the first, the first, first five. Um, mm -hmm. Before you uncommented the line on, on that cell, yeah, that mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. was the description of the data provided somewhere or how did you know that this, this column yes. represents Nanyami? Yes, I have the description of the data. Okay, oh, just, okay. yes, we have the description of the data here. Oh, maybe I missed that one. Yes, so the first column is buying price. 
the second column we have the price of the maintenance and then number of doors capacity in terms of how many people it can carry the size of the luggage boot and estimated safety of the car so the estimate the safety of the car is what is called class and what we're going to be predicting for. Oh, okay, fine. Okay, okay, great, great. Right, so let me just uncomment the same one again. I hope everyone else is okay. So, uh, how do you pip install? Are you on Collab or are you on local? Uh, don't people install on a shell? Oh God, I can't see that clearly. Um, when you're local, just go there, go um, on any cell on your Jupyter notebook. You can just do the pip install there. All right. So for what I like to do for any data set that I get is to first to do a profile report. It's the initial, it is a function, it's an inbuilt function for, from Pandas profiling that, let me just run this so It gives you all the statistics about your data set. It's going to tell us whether there are any missing values. It's going to tell us whether there are any null values, whether there are any missing and null values, same thing, um, whether there are any duplicated values. It's going to give us the data types of the different columns. So it's a pretty far, it's a pretty good first step to go through before you're able to tell what exactly can you do with your data sets. So here we are. This is what you're going to see at the beginning overview. Uh, let me just pause so that everyone can get where I am. Let's reduce the size of it as well. Okay, so it's giving us an overview and it has three sections. So we have the overview, there's a tab for alerts. This is where we have, it's going to give you all the different issues that you're supposed to be aware of before you continue with your analysis and then reproduction. I rarely ever pay attention to this because it's just details about the command. Now for overview, it's given us statistics about the main data set. So the number of variables we have, seven, the number of observations, uh, 1, 000, okay, 1,700. We don't have any missing values. We don't have any duplicated drawers. And then this is the size it's taking in our memory. Um, so this is why I say our data set is pretty clean and it's going to be easy to create a model for it. Um, another thing it shows us is the different co columns, uh, the distinct values in each column. So like here, this is the buying column, our very first column for buying price of the car and it has different categories. So it's telling us whether the price of the car is very high, high, low, or medium. And it seems like the data points are sort of uniformly distributed through the column. So again, for maintenance, same thing for doors. So now for doors, we're going to do a bit of engineering because we have two, three, four, and then five or more. I guess that is what this was supposed to say. So we really can't work with this is, so any variable in most variables in Python, you can call it a string. So we can't work with such a string when it has an integer and an object. We, we're going to have to change that. Uh, Passons, same thing. We're going to change this more into something else. Lag boot, so it's either small, big, or medium. The data points are pretty well distributed as well. The safety of the car and our class. So a bit later, we're going to talk about something called a class imbalance, where you have a certain variable that is not so uniformly distributed. So in our case, we have so many cars that are in an acceptable condition, and then even less that are in very good condition. Here's our heat map. We're going to talk about heat map a bit later, what it is, what it entails. But it's just showing us the relationship between the variables. 
And something you're going to hear most data scientists say is correlation is not causation. So just the fact that say maybe there's a high correlation between buying and maintenance does not mean there's any direct relationship with them. It doesn't mean a change in buying could drastically mean uh, anything for maintenance. And so let's just, it's going to break down a bit more of the analysis that we talked about. It's going a bit deeper into now seeing, visualizing the missing values. So we don't have to go through that right now. I'm going to pause here again for any questions. Or clarifications, please don't let me lose anyone. Just let me know what is possibly not clear. You're unable to load your profile report. Did you pip install Pandas profiling? Or what is the error? Are you getting an error or is it just loading forever? Also, let me know if you're on Collab or Jupyter Notebook. Mm -hmm. Is it giving you an error? <laughs> yeah, so on Jupyter Notebook, the profile report takes longer sometimes, depending on uh, your machine. So just give it some time and then it runs. Okay. Anyone else who still hasn't loaded their profile report? I'll just pause here and wait for you. Okay, great. So now after you've gone through the data profile, then you're going to see that our data set doesn't really need a lot of cleaning or manipulation in order to be passed through an ML model. So we're not really going to do any of that. Instead, we're just going to go through a bit through what is data cleaning, uh, what do you normally encounter while you're doing data cleaning and what you're supposed to do. Uh, so I'll just ask a few questions. Can anyone in the chat give me uh, the code for checking for missing data, what we call null values? Anyone? Okay. Um, so I will give an example of, oh, let me see what this is. Yes. Yeah, Joy, Joy has shared something. Yeah, yeah, Joy is right. So you have to do a uh, dot is now. So in our case, we can actually do that right now. So what the data, the data report has done, it's already done that for us. So we don't actually have to go into it and do it, but let me add a cell down here. Uh, where is this? Okay. Just add a cell here and do BF. So when you do this, it gives you the data frame and then goes through the columns, checking whether there are any now values. So we're getting false because there are no now values. Now, another way to do this to get a bit of a simpler outcome, you can do df.isnow.sum. So it sums up all the now values in each column and then 
gives it to you in a number. So now in the buying column, there are no null values. Uh, in the maintenance price column, no null values again, and such and such. Thank you, Joy. That was good. Yes. Great. Someone even had it there. Thank you, Francis. Good. So another thing we deal with is outliers. Um, outliers, let me give you an example of a data set we have that could possibly have outliers. So we can pick information about all the houses in, say, Kiambu Road. So you're going to find, um, let's say, Kiambu Road before... I don't know if I remember the name of the bypass over there, but I just say bypass. So before you get to bypass, we're taking all the information about the houses there. So we're going to take uh, information about the number of bedrooms, about uh, the number of balconies, about the number of rooms apart from the bedrooms. So like number of bathrooms, we can take data about size of the sitting room and such and such. So when you get information about all this, you can have columns that have bedrooms, five bedrooms, you can have columns with one bedroom, you can have columns with zero bedrooms, and then you can find that there's a house with say 33 bedrooms. So when you're trying to build a machine model for such a data set, then you're going to consider that house with 33 bedrooms as an outlier so that it does not introduce noise into your data and possibly give you results that cannot be generalized well. When you go to a similar neighborhood to um, Kiambu Road and try to maybe what predicts the price of the houses there. I hope that example helps in terms of what missing data could be in your data set. All right, great. You see me pausing and scrolling is because I'm waiting for any comments, questions that anyone might have or clarifications, please. Great. Mm -hmm. So another thing that people are mostly curious about and a word I mentioned at the beginning is feature engineering. Um, I myself, when I was learning data science, I felt like they used such a big word to describe such a small thing. <laughs> feature engineering is basically taking, so now when you use correlation, you're going to see that there are certain variables that we normally consider a correlation of 0 0.6 to be high enough to kind of investigate those variables a bit further. So if we found that the price of buying a car and the price of maintaining a car are highly correlated in the sense that the higher the price of the car, the higher the maintenance price, you're going to have to look at it a bit more and figure out why is this relationship happening. And then you're going to also want to figure out which of the variables you're keeping in your data set. That is one example of uh, the reasons you could need to do a bit of feature engineering. Another example is you have two variables that are directly, have a direct relationship. Um, let me think of an example of what it could be. Ah, actually a, a very, very simple uh, example would be you have a data set, uh, this is in GIS. you have a data set that has information about location. Now, when most of the sensors that we have that are collecting information, they're not going to tell you, sorry, location, they're not going to tell you that uh, this point is, what? This point is Nairobi CBD, and then this point is the Upper Hill, and then this point is, Ngong Road, this point is Kilimani, this point is where and where. When we're collect collecting location, we get the latitude and the longitude information. So in this sense, you're going to want to keep your data a bit simple so that you can maybe understand what's going on in this information. So you're going to feature engineer another column called location that combines the longitude and the latitude so that you're able to plot the data points and 
visualize whatever information you'd like to visualize from that. Okay. That image is feature engineering. Two data points that can give you the same information, you combine them to create one point that helps you to either visualize your data or generalize the information a bit better. I'll actually have a very good example here, taking the height and the weight to inform what the BMI could be. Right. So this notebook has been shared with you, so make sure to go through it step by step um, alone to just kind of get all the information, the beautiful information that we have there for you. Uh -huh. So data visualization. I'll just pause here to see if you have any questions about feature engineering, anything we talked about before, or I'd like someone to offer up any information about what they think data visualization is, like use different words from what I've used there, whether you agree or whether you think it could be something different. Looks like they're all excited to get to the modeling. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh -huh. So before you do any sort of machine learning, before you start thinking about what algorithms you're going to uh, work with, uh, whether you're going, I don't know whether guys have already gone as far as doing research into the different algorithms that we have. So whether you're going to give it, uh, now that you're talking about a classification problem, whether you're going, whether it's going to be a logistic regression model, whether we're going to do, use any tree models, before any of that, you have to be sure that the data you're feeding your model is number one, not categorical data, because machine learning does not know how to read let me just say textual data. Any information that you feed an ML model has to be an integer form. So that is what we're going to do right now because all the characteristics we saw in our data set were in text form. So it was telling us whether the buying price is low, medium or high. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So it's telling us whether the buying price is low, medium or high. We need to change this into values that the machine learning model is going to understand. So this is what we call um, encoding your data. And we have different types of encoding. You'll hear about one-hot encoding, ordinal encoding. Now, ordinal encoding, we use ordinal encoding for ordered data. And this just means data that is ordered in a certain manner. We can say, for example, in school where we have either pass or fail, uh, Actually, our data set describes that very well. So we have information about the size of the lag, where we keep our luggage. Is it small, is it medium, or is it big? Now, when you do ordinal encoding, you're assigning weights to the variables that you have, which is very important in this case. We don't want to give it zeros and ones because this is not going to tell us whether this zero means low, whether it means medium, whether it means high. So you have to categorize your variables. So in the buying column, with low, we assign it one, with medium, we assign it two, and so on and so forth. This is what helps us, helps us assign the correct weights to the different um, data points that we have, so that at the end, they do not lose their actual meaning. So this is what I've done here. Number one, we create an object, we call it a column mapper. This is what most people call a dictionary. Uh, so you, sorry, an object, you have the buying mapper and then you want to set low to one, medium to two, so on and so forth. And we do it for all the columns. So you've done it for your buying column. You've done it for the size of the luggage compartment. You've done it for safety. And then we also do it for our class. Now we don't need it to do this for the doors and person, sorry, for the doors and persons column because they're the only of engine, the only tweaking we have to do is for the column that we saw has more or five more. So we're just going to change that from doors to five more. We're going to change that to five. 
And then the more in persons we're going to change it to five as well, because it gave us two, three, four, and then more. All right. So once you create your object here, you have to pass it to through an encoding parameter. So this using a very big word here for passing the parameter, but we're basically creating a new column in our data frame. So we're calling a data frame, creating a new column co called buying encoded, and then assigning that column to be replaced, sorry, to replace the buying column, to replace the value in the buying column. Excuse me, just a second. Sorry about that. Right, so I'll just start that again. So we're creating a new column called buying encoded, and we want to pass our mapper with this information through the buying column and then replacing the values in the buying column with either one for low, two for medium, three for high, and four for very high. So again, you call our data frame, you add a column called buying enc, and then you replace that you place the information in this column with the information from the buying column, but having passed the mapper through it. Okay. I'm going to pause there so that people can kind of just take in this specific column. You can just run it and see what the output is. So we run our map with the different columns, assign those values in new columns that we're creating. Uh, we're changing the, vari the variable, the information in variables, those that have five more, we're replacing it with the number of five. And then the variable persons, anything there that has more, we're replacing it again with the number five. And then we visualize to see whether this has worked. So say for buying where we had very high, we can see it has changed it. The buying and coding column has taken that and changed it to four. The same for lab boot where we had small, uh, it has assigned it one. Let me pause there. We did. Okay, great. So now after this, what we do is we no longer need the columns that has the information that we already replaced. So I'm just going to create a new data frame with only the columns that I need, which I've called them. So buying encoded maintenance and the rest, and then I'm going to visualize that. And that's what we're working with now. Um, All right, so after this, now that we're ready to start doing a bit of a mail, we're just going to check our class variable, see what that looks like. Same thing, uh, the unacceptable condition seems to be the highest number of, uh, of features that we have in our data set and followed by number two, which is acceptable, number three, four, good, and then number four, four very good. After we do that, it would also be good practice to see how this compares, how this distribution compares to all the variables in our data set. So what that code is going to do, it has plotted all the different features and then compared it against the class variable. So when you see something like this for persons, then it means 
uh, there's nothing for no cars in no cars in the persons category had a very good condition. Uh, if you see this, this is for doors available, pretty equally distributed in terms of condition. The same for safety, same for lug boot, same for count of maintenance, and then for buying. Good. Just run that code and then look a bit what is happening. All right, great. So I'm going to ask you to comment these two lines to see what happens there. Another okay. duplication running. So we're doing ju this just to make sure that all the variables in our data, the data frame that we're going to use to run our model are in integer form, which they are. Actually, didn't need to even cast them to type ends. Oh, we did, okay. Next, we can check for correlation. Uh, the group is so quiet now. I'm not sure whether I'm alone in this. Guys, are you following? Let me actually just pause there for questions and comments. Okay, I'm not seeing questions in the chat box, but there are new people who've joined. Mm -hmm. So, Yona, welcome. We're just for, um, continuing <laughs> with our machine learning um, with Python workshop. So in case you have any questions or you feel stuck, please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, yeah, feel free to stop us. Again, I'm sorry about my background noise. Uh, evening in a home, anyway. Uh, right, so this is our correlation matrix. Again, we're just looking at the correlation between the variables and whether we need to be worried about how they're related to each other but doesn't look like there is. As I mentioned earlier, we're more concerned when variables have a correlation of 0 0.6 and above. That's when you have to do a bit of more investigation to kind of find out why that is happening. So we're going to finally jump in into our modeling. So I'll, I'll do a bit of reading here. So modeling is where we use maths and statistical approaches to answer the analytical questions that might have come up during our EDA. Uh, so predictive modeling is the process of using statistical methods to predict an outcome of an event. These are a few of the definitions that we gave at the beginning. So we have to be sure that number one, we're choosing the correct model. This is why I was saying, uh, so this is what I mentioned earlier when I was saying you don't just assume that whatever data set you have is going to work very well with a linear regression model, logistic regression model, whether you're going to have to fit a tree model there. You have to do a bit of investigation, see the relationships between the variables. Um, yeah, let me just stop there with the examples. So you have to see the relationship between the variables. You have to check for linearity and nonlinearity so that you know what model is going to be very good for what you're doing now. So once you, you're sure of the distributions, once you know the relationship between the variables, what affects what, what you need to build in order to generalize it on your on unseen data very well, the first thing we do is we split our data. So you have to separate the target variable from the independent variables. The independent variables are what you're going to hear most people call um, features, uh, what do other people call them? Actually, tell me what do most people call independent variables in your circles if you've been around data for a while? What do most people call the independent variables apart from features? Anyone? 
I want to see what it later features. Mm -hmm. Predictors, good. Okay, so you have to separate them into X and Y. We're just creating a data frame that has all our independent variables and then separating it from the target. And then after that, we have to divide it into what we talked about earlier, train tests, train sets and test sets. So here we have X train. This is where we're going to test our data on the X test. And then we have the Y train and test it on the Y test. So in order to do this, we're going to run a function that we imported earlier called the train test split. You pass it through X and Y, you can choose what test size you want and then the random state. Uh, make sure to run your code. I just realized I haven't run mine. That's the only one. Yeah. So run the initial code for splitting the data into independent and target variables, and then create the train and test sets. So we can finally build our logistic regression model. So we had um, said earlier that the target variable has four classes that we would like to predict for. We'd like to look at the features and be able to tell whether the sure be able to tell whether the condition is unacceptable, whether it's acceptable, good, um, very good. Since there are more than two distinct classes, you will uh, once you talk about logistic regression, you're going to hear about either a binary classification or a multi-class classification. Now, binary, as we all know, is two classes, whether it's yes or no, zero or one. Now for a multi-class where you're predicting for different classes is where you're going to now build your multinomial logistic regression model. It is very suitable for handling multi-class models and sorry, multi-class problems. And it was specifically designed to model and predict outcomes with uh, multiple categories. So it's simple, it's computationally efficient, and it makes practical choice for small data sets. Like what we have right now with 1700, what you have right now with 1700 data points, we don't really need to start building a model of KMN for it. So before we fit our model, what we have to do first is, thank you, thank you. Before we fit our model, what you have to do first is normalize the data. But normalizing the data normally comes with a huge problem that ML engineers face that is called, um, data leakage and this normally happens when we normalize the data points first before we come and fit a model so what we're going to do right now is we're going to build a pipeline that standardizes the data and then passes our logistic regression model which is what i've done here we're going to pass a min max scalar and then we're going to after it passes the different folds through a min max scalar then it passes it through a logistic regression model now, the reason why we normally choose a min max scalar. Sorry, just a second. Right, so when we're fixing, when we're trying to standardize our data, it is mostly because when you're measuring different variables at different stages, no two variables contribute equally to a fitting a model. We've already seen that we've assigned different weights to our data points, so we can't really pass any regular uh, scaling, uh, function 
And that's why we decided to go with the min max scaler for this. So our data our pipeline, it's going to take us, it's going to standardize our data and we're putting it in a pipeline so that it standardizes every different fold differently and then passes it through the model. This helps our model perform a bit better. And then we don't get a problem with number one, uh, we don't end up creating bias for the different variables. And number two, we do not get any data leakage. Um, data leakage is mainly using any information in our test data in the training data. So in that way, you'll not be able to generalize well in your test data because you've already trained it with data points that it has seen. So whatever information that you get at the end is going to be biased. Seeing a few comments, I'm going to pause and see what those are. Um, yes, someone is answering Midra about selecting a random state. Yes, there is no criteria for selecting a random state. I think the best definition I saw about a random state was that you're just telling your model how many times you want it to run every time it's running. So if I set it to 23, then every time I run it, it's going to run at a, it's going to run uh, at a, what is it called, a shuffle of 23? Uh, that's possibly not the right word to use. Are we together? I don't know if someone's stuck elsewhere. We talked about random state somewhere else. I'm just pausing for questions, clarifications, if you need anything. Okay, great. So now let's run that cell. That is the output you're going to get. So here we're just instantiating the model and then we have to pre and you instantiate the model, you fit it to your X train and Y train data. And then you come and now try to predict for the X test. So the predict column is predicting for the X test and then we are testing using Y test to see how well our model was able to generalize on that same, on that same data. Can someone tell me whether they think 83 is a good performance for the model or a bad one? Anyone, if you build a machine learning model and then you get 83%, fairly good. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? If you get a score of 0.83 or 83%, would you be, yeah, good. Right, so after we fit and we check the score of how our model is performing, the next step, the next best step to take is to evaluate the model. And here we're going to evaluate using number one, the classification report and also a confusion matrix. So what the classification report does, it, it gives you precision recall, the F1 score, and it's giving for the different classes. So how well was the model able to predict for one? How able was it to predict for this and such and such? And then it gives you the accuracy. So our accuracy was 0.84. I'm going to explain these numbers. Next, what we can use to I just pause there for a second. Okay. No questions. So next we plot what we call a confusion matrix. So what the confusion matrix does, it sort of, it takes these values and tries to explain them a bit better. So here it's giving us the numbers in terms of performance, but then the confusion matrix, what it does is it tries to tell you um, the features that were correctly predicted and the ones that are not. So all the features in this diagonal line, 
those are our, are our correctly predicted features. So for the first class, we were able to predict 349 correctly, and then we predicted 34 incorrectly as being in the, the acceptable class uh, when they were not. That's your question. Yes, we're going to check for whether it's overfitting. So your model could be overfitting when it performs very well on the train set, and then when you fit it on your Y, it's not able to generalize properly. So when you get, you can't tell directly from getting a score of 84% whether a model is performing well or not. This is why we check the precision and the recall. We don't just rely on the accuracy alone. So we want to see the actual numbers of how well it's generalizing for the different data points. And then we also plot the confusion matrix just to see where the issue really is. Why is it able to generalize this very well, but then in other classes, it's not able to fit the model, sorry, to generalize very well. So we have a bit of information there on how to interpret the confusion matrix. So we have the we have the true positive, false not positive, true negative, false positive. So the true positive is the where we've been able to predict correctly. In our case, three forty nine is the true positive. This is these are the numbers we've been able to predict correctly. Like we've said, this class is unacceptable, and the model was able to generalize well for these data points and mark them as unacceptable. Now, for false positive is where the model predicted the positive class, but is what it was actually negative, and this is what we get here. Same goes for true negative. So the model correctly predicted the negative class. And then for false negative, the model predicted the negative class, but it was actually positive. I'm pretty sure we have a number of questions here. So I'm just going to pause questions, comments, and go ahead and ask. Questions, comments, or clarifications? Okay, so if I move uh, right down to the explanation we have done here, this is where we're saying we're going to talk about the numbers up there again. So the accuracy is calculated using the values that we have in the confusion matrix. So we take the true positive plus the true negative, we divide it plus divide by the true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. That gives us the accuracy that we're seeing here. When you go to precision, it's the percentage of positive predictions. So then you take the true positive divided by the true positive plus the false positive. For recall, it's different because you're taking now the positive cases that were correctly predicted and you calculate it, you divide it by true positive plus the false negative. Because you want the actuals predicted. Now I'm going to talk about one importance about using the confusion matrix. So we normally use it for, for classification problems when we're trying to classify something like uh, whether a patient has terminal cancer or not. So you're going to decide what you want to rely on. Would you rather rely on precision or would you rather rely on recall? So we've said precision is the percentage of positive predictions. I, would you rather say that a patient's ha that patient has terminal cancer when they do not, or would you rather have a patient say that they do not have terminal cancer when they do? 
So for things like medical data, it's very important to know how you're calculating accuracy. I mean, sorry, precision and recall, because it could be the, excuse me. Apologies. Um, so David is talking about me being in a very dark room after I decided to turn on the lights. <laughs> um, right, okay. So I hope most of us have a bit of an understanding about what uh, the confusion matrix does. What, what is the importance of a confusion matrix? And I know that now that you guys have this notebook, you're probably going to go through it pile up pile and just Google is going to help us like understand most of these things. Yeah, so I have my conclusion of what of how I feel the classification, sorry, the logistic regression model performed. An accuracy of 84% is pretty good. I agree with, um, sorry, I can't remember the names of the people who said it was good. But normally we evaluate so that we can be able to tell uh, the F1 score, the precision and recall. Now, from what we saw, class one was calculated pretty well with a very high precision and recall, but then the model was not able to classify two, three and four properly. So because of this case, um, the first assumption I made was that probably because of uh, the imbalance in our target variable, we could try and apply um, something called SMOT to introduce a bit of data for the minority class. And when we say minority class, we just mean the classes that were not very well represented. So in our case, the one that was very well represented was the unacceptable class and then good, very good, and acceptable were not very well presented. So what SMOT does is it introduces noise and, do I even want to say it's noise? Let me just say it introduces, it's kind of number one, oversamples the minority class to kind of balance the data points that we have and then see how well we're able to pass our model through this and see how it performs. Please ask me questions that might not have been a very good explanation. So just ask me to reiterate and tell you what exactly I'm trying to put across. Right, now that we're together there, let's just run that and see how well that model performs. So we have 82.7% for that model. Uh, no one wants to build a model and then try to improve on it and see those scores dropping. It's usually, oh my God, what just happened here? But we have an explanation for it. So before we do that, let's just look at the classification report. Oh, and this is, uh, there's a cell there that says, in case you encounter an error for IMB LAN. Now, when we're trying to build a pipeline and pass smooth through it, we cannot use SKLAN. We have to go to the IMB LAN library and import, import the pipeline as well as smooth. So in case you're on Jupyter Notebook and you get the error, no module, IMB LAN, you have to pip install. You can just pip install in a cell pip install IMB LAN and then run that cell. Okay, great. So let's look at why the smoke didn't perform very well. Again, it looks like it's pretty easy to predict for the unacceptable class than the other ones. So let's just go ahead and plot that and see what our confusion matrix looks like. Right, so it's still predicting very well for the unacceptable, not as well for acceptable. 
Let me just pull you for the rest. So the reason why SMOOT did not improve our model is number one, when you're using logistic regression, it's not very sensitive to class imbalance. So you won't find the issues where this model is not generalizing well because it's in more of the unacceptable class than the other class. So applying SMOOT instead of what it wanted it to introduce, it introduced a lot of synthetic data and now our model was not able to generalize very well. And this is the reason why we got a very poor performance. Another reason is SMOOT, the moment you introduce something, of course, that is going to help your modeling, there's very high likelihood for overfitting. And this happens a lot with SMOOT. It can lead to overfitting because it's able to generalize very well on the training set. And then, I mean, sorry, it's able to predict well on the training set. And then when you introduce it to new data, it's not able to generalize, generalize very, very well. Now, because of this, I thought we can look at the uh, decision tree classifier. Now, the main reason why we introduced this here, it's because it has, it can handle more complex decision boundary compared to linear regression. So I thought it would be the best to build on linear regression and kind of see how it's performing. So just go ahead and load that model. Oh, there we go, 99%. I feel like any data scientist would be would be very afraid of that score. Because you see 99 and you're like, hey, 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 no, this is probably not a good sign. Someone tell me whether they feel like this is good or is our model overfitting? Anyone? Assumptions. Do we feel like our model is overfitting? Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else? 99%. Is, does anyone feel like they're comfortable with this? I want to see if there's anyone who's pro 99%. Anyone, anyone? I'm going to assume everyone feels like Greece and things. Ah, this is overfitting. Yeah. So, of course, you see 99% and you feel like, I oh, know, I cannot deal with this. So, before we jump into any conclusions, of course, we have to evaluate our model. So, we run the classification report first. Um, okay. So, precision, pretty good. Recall, so okay. F1 score, some. Looks good. It looks like it's generalizing pretty well. So confusion matrix to just plot those values there. Right. So it was actually able to predict really well. Uh, it was only unable to predict three. So it predicted three unacceptable outcomes as acceptable. And then it predicted two acceptable outcomes as unacceptable but it was able to generalize for good and very good quite well. Like we don't have any wrong predictions there. I think the moment you visualize and see how the numbers act, then you know, okay, so 99% was pretty good and it was not overfitting. As long as, our able is, as long as our model is able to generalize very well on unseen data, then we're, very, we're okay with a score of 99%. But we don't end it there. We can instead, if you're able to get more data and see whether it performs well on unseen data and see how much the score changes, then you can know whether you want to pass it to a different model or whether you feel like the decision tree is good. But from this conclusion, I felt like the decision tree was able to generalize very, very well on our data set and there was no need to go into another model. So what we do now is we save our model so that we can deploy it. So there's a file we, sorry, there's a function we imported. There's a library we imported earlier called Pico. That is what we use to save our model as a .pico file. So just run that code. And then when you come to 
files here. Yes, you're going to see that your model has been downloaded. All right, great, I hope everyone is there. Do we have any questions before we go to next steps? So now when we talk about machine learning models, after you've done that, you've saved your model and then what happens next? So this is where we talk about the real world applications. You have to build a model and then have some use cases for it. So this is where deployment comes in. So deployment process of taking a trained model, you make it available for use in the real world applications. And you do this by either creating an app that is going to take information from users and then pass it through a model and give them a prediction. And this is how you bridge the gap between technical and need basis. So you have a technical team. It is able to take your data sets through beautiful algorithms, make predictions that perform very well, but then what does this do for you? You have to either build, a, you have to come up with a way that you're going to, number one, if you're selling a product, you have to come up with a way you're going to offer this product to your customer. You're not going to go there with a file and tell them, I have this model. It's going to predict whether cars are in an acceptable state or not. So your customer would be like, okay, yes, I have cars and I want to know their condition. I want to know if I sell them, is someone going to come ask for their money again or not? What exactly am I going to use? So what you give them is either a website or an app where they can give all this information. So check whether this particular car that you have has, is the buying price very high? Check. Is the maintenance price going to be high? Yes or no? Check and all the other variables that we've talked about. And then after that, pass it through your model and it tells you whether the car is in good condition or it's in an acceptable condition. So we're not going to do that in our session today, but I have some reading material there. So this is, it's a link that's going to lead you to, I think it's called Forward Data Science, Toward Data Science. It's a site that hosts amazing articles that will help you in your data science journey. You can go through that reading material, sorry, material. There are other um, blogs, <laughs> I'm spacing on whatever articles, yes. There are other articles on Toward Data Science that still talk about deploying. So you look at that article, look at other articles that you feel can help. There's a different article on machine learning deployment. And then there's someone on GitHub who has hosted the deployment of this particular project. So you can also look at that, look at the dependencies, dependencies they've asked for, and then you can follow along on that project. Right, so that is the end of our, a bit of our technical work today. I'm just going to pause here again for any questions about the project. And yeah. Before I hand it back to, before I hand it back to, before I hand it back to Sasha. Anybody raise your hand, put it on the chat. Okay, great. Um, Sasha. Okay, thank you so much, Lucille. Um, can we appreciate Lucille? I know if it would have been an in person one, we would have done our kind of like hand claps, but can use the emojis for now. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Sydney. Thank you for all the love hearts and the claps. I'm seeing all of them. Much, much appreciation. 
um, Lucille for the amazing uh, fa facilitation. Thank you so much um, for taking us through um, the technical workshop. I don't know, are there any beginners here who are curious to know how they can get started? So if you have a question just around like, I'm a complete beginner, where do I begin? Please unmute yourself and just ask. Um, I know Lucille is happy to guide you and share some tips on, on what you can do. Any beginners who have found this so interesting and you have like a general question to Lucille, it doesn't have to be related to the workshop, feel free to unmute and ask. Okay, uh, for me, uh, okay, there's Guya, yes, Guya, please go ahead. Yeah, as for me, I'm a beginner, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, what, what, wh when do you know which uh, package to get? Because I'm just saying, oh, you need pick on, wh when do you decide that now it's time for me to pick pick on, or whatever other package that uh, uh, will be, helpful in your, uh, 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 helping you to come up with a better algorithm. Okay, Lucille, that's for you. Yes. Um, so I, I'll assume you're not only talking about the pickle file, but the other algorithms as well. So I think, uh, please, yeah, is that what you're asking? Exactly, exactly. Yes, great. So um, I think this is where I'll also sell the Moringa program very well is you have to have a background in statistics for data science, for machine learning. You have to have a background in statistics because you have to know how this model is going to perform behind the scenes. Um, that's why earlier I was talking about something like um, decision tree and why we would justify it for our model. So we decided to go from logistic regression. So we know that logistic regression is able to classify when it comes to multi-class problems. When I mentioned we have different types of classification algorithms, logistic regression is one of them, but how do we know this? So the statistics behind logistic regression is able to tell us whether it's a good enough problem to solve for, to, to solve sorry, whether it's a good enough solve for a multi-class problem. Um, and then when we move to decision tree, we justified it by saying, we're going to build on our lean, a logistic regression model by, I'm actually seeing a mistake I made on our notebook. I said linear regression instead of logistic regression. So we're building on our logistic regression model because our decision tree classifier is able to handle more complex decision boundaries. It's able to go through our variables and make decisions about them in terms of the importance uh, according to how uh, their weights, sorry, according to their different weights for our, sorry, for our data frame. And the same for goes, now for PICOL, we were using it so that we we're able to download our model. Uh, I used PICOL, I'd say probably in Mazoya, but I believe there's also Joblib that you can use to download your model, sorry, after you're done. So it just depends on the background that you have with these algorithms, how well you understand them, uh, how do you know when to apply linear regression? Uh, if it's an unsupervised problem, how do you know whether to use k-means? It's the statistics that you've learned before and then the relationships that you get in your data set and how you're able to apply the two together. I hope that answers your question. Very well, thank you. Okay, great. Back to you, Sasha. Okay, thank you so much. I'm seeing more questions coming in. Um, so please, uh, I'm typing on the chat box uh, before we end the webinar in like 10 minutes. Um, not even 10, we'd like to give more time for Q&A. So we still have like 20 minutes to go, guys. I'm just asking you to take a minute, click the link that I've just placed in the chat box and give us your feedback. How did you like um, this webinar? What, what um, other topics um, 
in data science would you like us to organize for and bring you more free workshops, both in person and webinars for those who are away from you? Yeah, so please take a minute and fill in the feedback form. It will really help us um, curate more events and even answer any other questions that you may have um, for us. Okay, so um, I've seen a question from Edwin and Victor around financial aid. So, um, okay, please fill the feedback form so that we get your email, Victor and Edwin. Um, and then on the part for any questions for the Moringa School team, let us know about financial aid and then we'll email you the expression of interest form. Um, we have um, a team that will then um, reach out to you with the next steps um, on how like you can go about it. Because we have very, very, very few available spots. Um, for partial scholarships. Hence why I can't share that form right here. So fill the feedback form first so that we can get your details and follow up after this. That is Victor and Edwin. Angela is asking, how does your part-time program work? Do I have to attend the classes physically? All right, good question, which is exactly what we're just about to cover. So for those who have really enjoyed this um, session and you're curious about what's next from here. You've been self-learning, you've been attending these free, free webinars and all that, but you still need more. You still need like the fundamentals. You need to work on more um, industry-related projects, how to build your portfolio, how do you position yourself as a, data, as a data scientist to even land like your first job. So Moringa School, um, has both a part-time and a full-time program for anyone who wants to start from scratch until the end, okay? And our data science, both full-time and part-time program, you learn the same thing, okay? The only difference is like the duration which I will take you through very shortly. So in phase zero, when you join, you go through um, a series of like uh, um, your orientation process, um, and introduction to data science, Python programming and all that. So that like you can just understand all the tools that you need, um, all the content that you're going to cover in the course. Then into phase, uh, uh, on to phase one, then now you start getting into the in-depth of data science principles. So you'll cover data analysis, data engineering. The main programming language that we use here at Moringa is Python. But here and there, you will see us engaging with R programming. Uh, Lucille, you can correct me there. Then um, from there, um, we have a phase where you go into um, quantitative and scientific methods. Because even like from today's workshop, you've seen that in data science, you engage with a lot of data. So it's good to... Um, like familiarize yourself with those scientific processes. Um, you'd see that we require you to have a bit of like math and statistics understanding. Um, if at all you've ever like engaged with the application process uh, for, for Moringa, you'd see that we test for that, but don't shy away, try it. If you took mathematics in high school and in campus a bit, try, try it, because uh, we'll cover it more in depth um, in phase two. Um, then phase three and phase four, we focus a lot on um, machine learning. So today you've just gotten a test, a feel of what people learn. Now picture how much more um, is taught um, on the uh, machine learning fundamentals phase and machine learning advanced phase. And keep in mind guys that right now we are in the age of AI, yeah? We are in the age of AI. So it's good for you to upskill and position yourself to get ready for all these changes and all these skills that are required in various industries, be it in health, whether in banking, whether in finance, you are going to stand out if you have these data science skills, AI skills here and there, right? So that like you can be ready for what's coming up. Um, actually, I feel like we're living in the future. So AI is here right now. So get ready for it and we prepare you for all that there is a lot more 
visit our website. I'm going to ask Lisa to share the link to our website so that you can download the brochure and just see what's covered in each phase in depth, right? She's going to share the link to the website uh, very shortly. You can go to our website, download the brochure and read more and ask us questions. Ask us questions. Call our admissions office if you need more information on like what's going to be covered in the course and what you can expect to learn once you sign up and join. Um, then phase five, um, that's a period where we focus a lot on, on projects. So we're gonna work on like um, real life data sets, um, projects that you're gonna use now to build um, your portfolio, your CV, which you'll then after graduation be using to apply for jobs. Okay, so someone asked how our, our part-time classes work. So please focus on this uh, session. Um, so our full-time program runs for 25 weeks. Our data science course um, for now is still online for the full-time program, fully online. So you can learn anywhere. We have very good facilities and our, and our student management system that, um, you know, tools and all that that support your learning remotely. Um, for full-time classes, um, because it's very short, you're required to dedicate time Monday to Fridays, eight to around five, 6 p.m. Um, for classes. And the tuition for that is 174,000 Kenyan shillings. Then our part-time program, this one is more suited, the way it's been designed and spaced out, it's more suited for someone who's working. You're working and you can't take a break for 25 weeks to focus on a full-time course. You can still do it while you're juggling your work, you're juggling, family, business, and all this, okay? Be rest assured that our part-time course has been designed having you in mind, okay? And it takes 35 weeks. Um, the learning schedule is from Monday to Friday, uh, weekdays from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So there are days where you have to join for an active lecture from the technical instructor. And then there are days where now it is a lot of like self-learning and group work and focusing on projects. So once you sign up and through the orientation phase, you'd be explained how that works. Because remember at the beginning I told you, Moringa has a very unique learning model, okay? So blended, there's, there's gonna be a lot of like um, technical mentor support, self-learning and peer learning. Yeah, so all that is incorporated in the program for both full-time students and part-time students. And part-time classes, um, the tuition is 200,000 Kenyan shillings. So who qualifies for this program? Um, as long as you're above 18 years old and you have knowledge in maths and statistics, you're very curious um, on learning data science, you wanna fully immerse yourself in this career, or you're currently in a profession where you feel like data skills will make sense, you want to change, maybe, you're a health practitioner and you wanna become a data scientist, it's possible. It's really, really possible. So basically, as long as you can commit, you're curious, um, you have some knowledge in mass and, and statistics, proceed to our website and apply, then we'll take it up from there to guide you on what's next. So prerequisites to join, very simple. Like I said, you need to have the fundamental concepts of maths and stats. Programming is a nice to have. Like if you know a bit of programming here and there, it's a nice to have, but it should not be a barrier for you. It, you should not shy away from applying just because you don't know how to code. Yeah. Um, we, we are able to share with you resources beforehand so that you can just familiarize yourself before you join the course. Um, then, um, uh, of course, you need internet because our courses are online. You need to have a good um, command of the English language and attend all classes. Because for you to graduate, you need to make sure you've attended all the classes, you've submitted all your assessments, tests, project work, whatever your technical mentor has told you to do, you need to do that on time, right? Yeah. So someone is asking, when is the next intake? Um, let me just... The next intake uh, for the full-time program is, uh, is in July, on July 31st. 
Um, the next one will be later on in the year, which will be our last intake. So it's if you want to start learning and complete this soon, I would encourage you to apply for these intakes that are happening in July and August, right? The part-time one will start end of August. The full-time one will start um, on the 31st of July. So allow me to go back a bit. So the admissions process is very seamless, very simple. Once you go to our website, just speak, um, just read through each program and look at what suits you best. Once you've selected, let's say like now Joseph is interested in evening classes, then for you, please go ahead and apply for our part-time classes. Once you've applied, go through the entire process. Um, when you finish your application form, filling in your application form details, you'll be taken to a section where we do, we do an assessment test. So here it's just to gauge you and see whether you qualify um, to the program. Um, on that test, depending on how you score, you will now move to the next stage. If you don't pass, we'll recommend you a simpler course to do. <clears throat> if you pass, you proceed to the next stage, which is scheduling an interview. And then from there, you get more details on how to pay, how to prepare for orientation, everything that's required for you to do well in the program. You will receive all that through our admissions office. Okay. So what are the various um, payment methods? So at Moringa, we have um, a couple of payment methods to just support our students in their learning journey. So you can pay upfront if you have the fund. If you're not able to, there is a Lipa Polyapole stream, which is through the installment plan. So <clears throat> you can pay in two installments, three or four. Um, and all this has been spaced out well throughout the duration of the program that you've chosen so that you can manage to continue learning even as you clear your fees for the poly. Then we have um, financial aid. So with financial aid, um, you are, you, you, uh, okay. Once you apply for the course and you get admission, you can apply for a student loan through HELB or Aspira. Or like I said, um, we do have some partial scholarships, but very limited. So <clears throat> like I said, if you email our admissions office with that request, we'll be given more details on how to proceed and apply for a partial scholarship. But first, you have to go through all the steps. Apply, do the assessment, get an admission letter. Then you can apply for like, the loans or the scholarships and all that. Yeah. So are there any questions up to that point? Um, I can see a question from Julius. He says that he has done foundations, data science course, can I join the DS classes? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Just visit our website and then apply for the in apply for the track that you want and then in the intake. Then admissions representatives will reach out to you for further assistance. Um, Alpha, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, uh, I have only two questions remaining. One is that uh, you say that uh, the, the course is for anyone from uh, 18 years of age onwards. Uh, so I'm just wondering, will uh, my brother who was just cleared for, for be able to handle a data science course, uh, given that uh, he went through 844, um, uh, uh, I assume that him hearing of models, <laughs> yeah, him so, and maybe some other complex things, uh, because mm -hmm. um, as for me, I have a background in studies. So for him, I don't think that will work. And then uh, the last one, um, from my interaction with the most data scientists uh, or people who handle data, I've realized data is quantitative. Does that mean that, that, that there is no qualitative uh, roles for data scientists? 
Okay, thank you so much, Alpha, for your questions. I'll take the first one, then Lucille will answer the second one. Um, so good question around like our minimum age requirements. The reason why we we say 18 years um, is because people are different. There are people who will finish from four, maybe they went through another education system, right? And you know that <laughs> these other education systems are a bit advanced, more than our eight for four. Um, and they, pro they are probably just curious. They're like, I wanna have a feel of what this is all about before maybe I advance my studies um, at university level. Maybe they want to do a degree later on, right? So for them, we don't lock them out because you see what, what, what determines um, whether you join the course or not is how well you perform on the assessment test. And even throughout the course, there at after each phase, like we, we, are, we are monitoring performance, we are monitoring understanding and all that, right? But that is just like a needle in like a haystack, right? Because you'd find that because of the requirements that we've placed for data science, we enroll mostly, actually 90% of our students at university ongoing students in those IT related mass and statistic fields or even any other field and someone just wants to change their career. Um, university graduates who've completed, they're holding diplomas, they're holding degrees and masters, come back and upskill and working professionals. We have so many in our part-time course. So if you find like someone has just finished high school, it's like one in 10 of our students. Right, because it's just an exception of life. They just want, they are just curious for it before they make a decision on what's their next education, um, like what next they're gonna do education wise. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, no problem. I, I know my concern is well responded to. Thank you. Okay, okay. So Lucille will respond to the second question. Could he kindly just reiterate? Sorry? Could you just ask again, please, the second question? Uh, okay. Uh, let me, I think I'll, I'll have to paraphrase this because. No problem. Okay. Okay. I said uh, um, uh, my interaction with most people handling data, and even what you've taken us through is uh, good. Eh? And mm -hmm. um, my understanding data is uh, both quantitative and qualitative. So, Everybody who says they are a data scientist or yeah, handling data, all their data, all their day-to-day uh, -day work programs, it's just quantitative, quantitative. Quality. So my question was, does it mean data science has uh, in some way maybe or entirely neglect, neglected the qualitative uh, data in its, in their role as data scientists? Uh, uh -huh. Okay, I think before, just to make sure I understand this question very well from your perspective, what do you feel is the difference between qualitative and quantitative data? Mm, okay, quantitative uh, majorly dwells on things like are, uh, can be counted, you can, yeah, some 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 things to do with numbers. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's my understanding. And then qualitative is maybe things like perceptions, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, like um, I've had a chance to interact with uh, um, one qualitative software known as Envivo, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So can what um, like from that understanding can mm -hmm. what what NVivo does, can also that be part of, um, um, can I get such knowledge from uh, enrolling in a data science course? That is actually a more direct way of what I'm asking. Yes. Like, like okay, so the clouds and whatever, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm actually glad you mentioned a wild cloud because yeah. I believe that could even directly answer the question. So we do deal with both qualitative and quantitative. So 
things like, I don't know, now that you're mentioning what cloud, I'm hoping you've heard about something called sentiment analysis. Mm, um, yeah, there's yeah, something yeah. we call building recommender systems. Uh -huh. So this data that we work with is hugely textual data that we have to convert into numbers and then make predictions about them. So sentiment analysis, we could, uh, okay, let me not get political. We could right now try and build, I mean, build a, a model that looks at the sentiments of how people are feeling about, um, what should I say? I want to talk about something, I, I really don't want to talk about politics. But yeah, we can just talk about it, how the how people are feeling about the political weather right now. Like we can decide to go on Twitter and extract data that's mostly just talking about the current economy, the current political state, and then kind of generalize how many people are feeling about. Um, in terms of recommender systems, we can try and most recommender systems are either for that are being built currently because of the major platforms that we have are recommender systems for movies or recommender systems for books. So you, for example, go into a library and look at the history of all their members and what types of books they like. And then anytime they come back and someone asks you, oh, I've finished my book, I'm not sure what I want next, I'll go look. You can just simply go into your a platform for whatever model that you've built for the library and recommend a particular book for this reader. So that is more of the qualitative data I'd say we, we work with according to your question. Does that answer you? I think so. I think so. Um, <laughs> please ask for yeah. clarity if you'd like it. Okay, so um, for example, I want to do something like a thematic analysis. Uh, how would that work? Because for sentimental, I think that one is much more clearer. From mm -hmm. What I've heard you speak. So mm -hmm. if I were to go the thematic analysis, maybe. Um, I'm not sure if I know what thematic analysis means. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You can just like explain mm -hmm. it better. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so in thematic analysis, like um, some people, uh, you can get, um, uh, okay, I'll take you back to uh, 844, where you, we mm -hmm. used to do um, set books. So mm -hmm. there are themes uh, in, in a given writing, themes. Mm -hmm. mm. You can get a theme which maybe is more, talk, more of a, dwelling on something like um, peace or whatever so you you arrange your um, people's thoughts and uh, and ideas according mm -hmm. to, to those themes with mm -hmm. respect to to, to 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 the documents you have at hand so maybe i don't know if i'm that yes clear. yes no, no no you're making sense that that also falls under NLP, what we call natural language processing, uh, it falls under NLP just as well as sentiment analysis. Okay. So NLP is what deals with textual data and then converts it and we can build a machine learning model from there. Okay, thank you. I think uh, then I'm, I'm good to go. All right, great. Back to you, Sasha. Awesome. Uh, all right, so... Um, Maybe to build on it, okay. so the, the, the good example that is, uh, that is uh, mostly in the market now, like most people are using to do maybe an name to do maybe to, it's uh, the latest one is Netflix, Netflix sentiment analysis. You can check out on the, on the internet. It was just a release to the other man. That is the best example that, and it is a bit simpler compared to other other sentiment analysis. Ah, oh, great! Thank you. All right, cool. Okay, so we've come to the end uh, of our webinar today. I'd like to really thank each and every one of you for making the time to show up for this um, workshop.
um, we'll share the recording after this. I know a couple of you are recording on your own machines, but we'll send a link latest on Monday so that you can catch up. Also the note, the code lab notebook, we'll send you a link so that you can just do practice um, on your own. Uh, for those who are interested in joining our programs, um, thank you so much for filling the feedback form. Um, we will be reaching out to you and just to make sure like you applied and you're clear on your next steps to join our next intake. So I've been your host, Sasha, uh, my team in the background, Lisa, you can just say hi before we, we end. And Lucille, who facilitated the workshop, thank you so much. So Lisa, you can just do the closing remarks and then we can call it a day. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sasha. So thank you for, again, the great facilitation. Um, I'm loving the engagement. And I'm looking forward to engage even further with um, our interested uh, uh, applicants. So you'll meet me on the customer support side of things. I work with the admissions team under a wing called Conversions. So I hope to engage you guys on that front and support you fully to ensure that you are making a well-informed decision. So thanks for sticking around and remaining engaged. And we hope to engage with you further. Cheers, bye bye. Awesome. All right. And in case you don't want to do the course and you know someone who is, bring them to us. Um, we are more than happy to um, receive referrals. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Um, see you on the streets of email. <laughs> bye. -bye.